everybody. Well, I hope you're as intrigued as I am as to why we were hearing and seeing at the waters before we're going to talk about uh, journalism ethics in the, the digital age. But I'm sure that uh, Professor Coleman will enlighten all of us on it. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Marianne Barrett. I'm the Senior Associate Dean here in the Cronkite School. And it's my pleasure to uh, uh, be introducing Mr. Coleman tonight. Uh, Mr. Coleman has already spoken with uh, my JMC 110 class about ethics, uh, so they're familiar with him. It's good to see so many of them back tonight. I just want to give you a little bit of background on Mr. Coleman. Um, it didn't take me very long to uh, do some research on him. Um, but one of the more interesting uh, places where I found his biography was on the History Makers, uh, which is um, a website where it features prominent African Americans. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of background on Mr. Um, Coleman. Uh, he's a native of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, where he attended elementary school and high school. And then uh, uh, at, by a stroke of luck, one would say, but also because he had worked really hard for it, uh, he was able to attend the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee on a scholarship that was uh, about $128 uh, for tuition. Um, and that set him on a path that uh, led him certainly to the Cronkite School today, but along the way led him to the Washington Post. But before he got to the Post, he began his, re his career as a reporter for the Milwaukee Courier. Um, he worked as a reporter and editor for several minority-oriented news outlets, including the African World newspaper in, North, in Greensboro, North Carolina, the All African News Service, WHUR in Washington, D.C., and the Community News Service of New York. Um, he also spent uh, quite a few years at the Washington Post, where he rose to editor, uh, one of the editors. Um, but his job at the Post was really focusing on ethics, dealing with corrections. Um, and he carried that after retired from the Post, he carried that over into his position as ombudsperson um, at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in Washington, DC. Uh, so tonight he's going to talk to us about the issues associated with journalism ethics in the digital age, and maybe give us a little bit of background on uh, why, besides the fact that she's just a joy to listen to, uh, we saw and heard Ethel Waters uh, at, the heart of, at the start of tonight's presentation. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Coleman. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Mm. Good evening. All right, there we go, there we go. So uh, everybody is wondering, what was that music about? You know, did I come to the wrong place? This guy's supposed to be talking about the digital age, and, and here's some music that goes back to probably 1945 or 1950, uh, maybe. Uh, it certainly ain't hip hop. Uh, and, and yet it's, um, it's very important because, uh, as the students in my classes will tell you, I really like to talk about journalism and journalism ethics in things that, in, in terms that mean something to me. And unlike many of you, uh, I never went to journalism school. I never did journalism in high school. I never did uh, journalism uh, in college. I took a, a course, a 12-week summer course at uh, Columbia U University Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, that was specifically geared for, for people like me, journalists of color who had no training. And the rest I sort of learned um, uh, in grade. I learned um, uh, on the job, what we used to call uh, OJT, on the job training. Uh, and I've learned all of the, all of the sort of rudiments of uh, ethical journalism uh, in practice, uh, simply by uh, reading and listening and, and having good mentors like um, uh, one who teaches here, Len Downey, uh, who I worked for. I, I guess I worked for Len pretty much all of my 36 years at the Post. Uh, he was one of those who hired me. But I like to reduce things to really, really uh, simple sort of phrases, because I think then we can all understand them. I certainly can understand them. 
uh, and they're certainly more understandable, more memorable than uh, some of the things we find in ethics books, although they mean the same. And my belief is that ethical journalists are fundamentally good journalists. Ethical journalism is fundamentally good journalism. Uh, in my, my course, the course that I teach is journalism, ethics, and diversity, and I make clear from the very beginning that this course is not about uh, the ethics of diverse journalism. This is a journalism course. There is no such thing as diverse journalism. There's just good journalism. Either you do it bad or you do it good. And that's what it's really all about. So why Ethel Waters uh, at the very beginning? Well, uh, that song, Stormy Weather, tells you a lot about Ethel Waters' life. Ethel Waters was really born in stormy weather. And, uh, she, um, uh, Ethel Waters' mother gave birth to her when the mother was 13 years old. And Ethel was married when she was 13 years old. She uh, never lived in one place, she said, when she was growing up, for more than 15 months. And um, she was the kind of person who was sort of, sort of tailor-made to be uh, uh, put down by other people. They always would tell her, uh, uh, she said, that she was, she was, she was nobody uh, because of her background. And yet, uh, she prevailed. She didn't believe that. And uh, that sort of feeling carried over to me in my life, in my community, uh, and in my church, where uh, we used to have a, a saying that sort of, for me, is a good way to start uh, ethical journalism and talking about it. And it was, it's a, something that we would always tell the kids uh, particularly those who we felt were particularly challenged. Uh, and people would tell them, you're, you're, you're a nobody. And they sort of grasped one of Ethel Waters' famous sayings, uh, which was this one. I know I'm somebody, because God don't make no junk. It's just that simple. I must be somebody, because God don't make no junk. What does that have really to do with ethical journalism? Well. What it has to do with ethical journalism is very simple. What we have come to call and practice as ethical journalism, as good journalism, really starts from a fundamental human right. Uh, I used to think it started with, you know, Thomas Jefferson, and if I had my choice, uh, I'd rather have a nation uh, with newspapers than no newspapers in a nation or something like that. And then when I traveled overseas a lot uh, in Latin America and in Turkey a little bit, I found out that, that we started journalism and freedom of the press from the First Amendment, because we had a First Amendment. In other parts of the world, they don't have a First Amendment. And they started talking about ethical journalism as a human right, the same kind of human right that Ethel Waters proclaimed when she said, uh, I am somebody because God don't make no junk. Because the foundation of ethical journalism is freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. And that's a human right. Because, yeah, God don't make no junk. Uh, God gives everybody a brain. God gives everybody a mouth, a tongue, ears, eyes. Gives us all the things to communicate. And the basic idea of human rights is that every one of us who's born a human being has the same rights. And part of that is the right to think, the right to speak, and to communicate. And that's really the fundamental right that underlies, uh, underpins ethical journalism. And uh, in the same way that Ethel Waters did it. And when the colonists decided that they did not want to continue to be subservient to the British. They proclaimed their own human rights in words with which we are much more familiar, which is um, that I pressed the wrong button. That's what it is. Uh, I'm going to, oh, oh, I got it. Ha, ha. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. All of us are not junk. 
all are created equal and given by that person who, who creates us certain unalienable rights. The moment you come on the face of the earth, those rights include life, I got a right to live. Liberty, I got a right to be free. Pursuit of happiness, I got a right to try to improve my life, to lead a better life. That's what all the immigrants say when they come here. Why don't you come to America? In search of a better life. So that's, that's how we said, if you live on this land that we call America, you have certain unalienable rights. A right to life, you have a right uh, to um, freedom, and you have a right to the pursuit of happiness. And so then when these same people or their descendants said, hey, I got a great idea. Let's come up with this thing called the United States. Uh, let's make that like a nation. And let's have a constitution. And within that constitution, let's, let's take some of these human rights and let's enshrine them so that anybody who's born a human being, who comes to live on this land, who then is a part of the United States, also has certain unalienable rights. And that's how we got to this, which is one floor down on the wall, where Congress shall make no law that would not, that would prevent us from practicing religion as we see it, that would prevent us from speaking, would prevent us from petitioning government for the redress of grievance, and would prevent us from peaceably assembling. And that's four of the five. The other, the fifth one is ours, freedom of the press, which goes beyond freedom of speech. Because freedom of speech says you can say anything you want to. Freedom of religion says you can worship any god you want to. You can, you can uh, hold the government accountable. You can gather in any place as long as you do it peaceably. But somebody's got to, something's got to hold together this nation. And that's why we need freedom of the press. We need some people who, who accept the democratic responsibility, the responsibility in a democracy, in a society, to communicate in a way that's the public interest. That's us. That's journalism. That's the real birth uh, of our side of the First Amendment. That's the birth of ethical journalism. We want to do it in a way that fulfills that constitutional mandate. And they made that, so they made that a civil right. It's a human right, and now it's in our Constitution. It's a civil right, you know, and it's in the First Amendment, which means they thought it, uh, pretty highly of it. And so that, that, that's kind of what, uh, where I see this whole thing being born uh, for us. And, and that was many years ago, so come on, Milton, get us back up there. You know, you, you took us back from Ethel Waters. Okay, so how do we get to what we now call ethical journalism today? Well, let's go to the end of the 19th century. The Civil War is over. There's a lot of newspapers out there. People, people read that Constitution and said, hey, freedom of the press, let me start a newspaper. And it was, a, it was really a crazy sort of situation because a lot of the people who started newspapers, they were really biased. You know, there were business owners who wanted to have their own uh, way. They were politicians who wanted the news to be the news that they wanted. And it was a kind of crazy atmosphere out there. People didn't know, what do you believe? What is really news in the public interest? So along comes this guy named Adolph Oakes. He buys a newspaper that is in bad shape, not making much money. And he realizes that all these people got newspapers, they're printing anything they want to. I want to do some stuff that people can believe in, that there can be credibility about. We now talk about credibility. And so I need to come up with a, a slogan or a motto that sort of says that. You know, I, I need to brand my news. And, uh, and that's what he did. And so he branded it with all the news that's fit to print. There's a lot of news out there, but I'm going to print this because it's ethical. And that is one of the things that we now depend on, credibility. I'm not saying that Adolf Oaks is the only guy, was the first guy to say this, probably a lot of other people did. But he coined a phrase that we can remember, and I think it is still uh, on the front page of the New York Times, all the news that's fit to print. Uh, 
That's sort of a way of branding that news. Then a few years later, another guy bought another newspaper uh, in Washington, D.C. at a bankruptcy sale. It cost him like $800,000. What a bargain, you know. Uh, and he was a guy, uh, he wasn't necessarily a businessman, but he bought this newspaper because uh, it was a good, it was a good buy, bargain basement price. And so people ask him, okay, Eugene Meyer, so now that you own this newspaper, what you gonna do with it? What's it gonna be about? Eugene Meyer espoused seven principles for the conduct of a newspaper, and it is those principles which those of us who worked at the Washington Post came to believe as really uh, our code of ethics, uh, our guidelines for ethical journalism. The first one was that the first mission of a newspaper is to tell the truth as clearly or as fully as the truth may be ascertained. The emphasis on the last part because from day to day, you might not know the whole truth, but you print the truth as best as you can determine it every day. That's ethical journalism. Uh, and secondly, the newspaper shall tell all the truth so far as it can learn it concerning the important affairs of, of America and the world and all that. In other words, we're not going to be censored. If somebody says, well, you shouldn't write about that, oh, no, we're going to write about that because that's in the public interest. That's really important to us. And by the way, I will tell you, as I tell my students, if it is okay to do this, uh, Marianne and, and, and Beth, uh, I can put this on Blackboard so you don't have to take these notes. Everything that's going to be up there will be on Blackboard uh, sometime tomorrow. Uh, uh, he also said, as a disseminator of news, the paper shall observe the decencies that, oblig that are obligatory of pro a private gentleman. It's going to be a decent newspaper. This is, we are not going to have what some people have come to call locker room talk. Not in this newspaper. You know, we're going to talk about uh, the way the gentlemen talk, because they, they uh, uh, decent gentlemen, you know. Uh, also, it's going to be a family newspaper. You can um, show it to your kids. They can read it around the breakfast table and all that. That's the kind of newspaper we want to be. That talks about the taste and the tone of how we will present the news. Then he says, okay, I may own this newspaper, but the newspaper's duty is not to me, but it's to the public at large. Uh, I'm not getting in this thing to make money. I'm not getting in this thing to tell people to believe what I believe. I'm in here so that the public can learn about things. And oh, by the way, he says in the sixth uh, point, in pursuit of the truth, the newspaper shall be prepared to make sacrifices of its material fortunes, if such course be necessary for the public good. In other words, if I'm going to lose money, if covering that story means I'm going to lose money, so be it. I'll lose money. And those of us who worked at the Post saw this time and time again. In the famous scene from All the President's Men, when uh, John Mitchell said, pardon the language, uh, tell Katie Graham she's going to get her tit caught in the ringer, um, Mrs. Graham in effect said, okay. I'll lose some money, because what Mitchell was saying is we're going to hurt your TV, uh, the TV stations you own. We're going to hurt you in your pocketbook. And Mrs. Graham said, so what? Uh, that's the cost of doing business. And time and again, when we, when we would go back, when the war um, broke out in Iraq, and Don Graham uh, came to the newsroom and said, how, how, how much of a budget do you need? Uh, and Len said, well, how much can we get? And, Don said, how much do you need? And they repeated that, and finally Len got the point. Uh, you're going to get whatever you need. Doesn't matter uh, on that. And then, and then finally, uh, the newspaper shall not be the ally of any special interests. And that reminds me of a phrase that a lot of people use when they say, we have no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, only permanent interests. And our interest at the Washington Post was in ethical journalism. And that is sort of the way that I learned about journalism ethics from those seven principles. I mean, it's not like we had to, we went through the, the portals and you had to carry a card around and read it every time. But that's the way journalism was practiced. 
And that is the newspaper journalism that I think we've all come to respect. And, and that's my way of going at it. And, and that, was, that was the promise that the publisher made to the newsroom. And the, and the other side of that covenant came from the newsroom, and a guy named Monty Curtis, who was in charge of news for the Knight Ritter newspapers, uh, had a, a way of expressing that. And when she said that our job is to make tomorrow's newspapers better than today's, daily discontent with the product is what has built every great American newspaper. So we're going to try to be better and better at what we do every day. That's a part of ethical journalism, to try to always uh, do your best. And how did that then, tra then translate down to us in the newsroom? Uh, you know, I've got half a dozen books, uh, textbooks in my office upstairs that talk about journalism ethics and have all different codes. And they get to be very long and they cite this and that. As reporters, we came to believe one thing, which I think was never written down anywhere, but uh, when we talked about ethics, we repeated it a lot. And it's how do you carry yourself as a Washington Post reporter? And it's very simple. We conduct ourselves in a way so that if our reporting process becomes public, we will not be embarrassed. We will not do anything that will embarrass us as upholders of the faith of ethical journalism. So that's how I got to ethical journalism. That's the way I like to, to explain it. Because uh, for me, uh, it's the easiest way to remember it. Uh, and it, it can guide me going through all these codes and all these conundrums uh, that we face uh, as ethical journalists. Uh, and now I've got to find out where I am in my prepared remarks, <laughs> uh, lest I get lost again. Okay, so in the current climate, we find ourselves really debating those basic principles of ethical journalism, which all boil down to the concept of truth and trust. If we tell the truth, will people trust us? That creates our credibility. And that is the thing that in this particular time, during this digital age, that's the thing we're being challenged on, because there's all sorts of debate going on around that. Some of it has to do with the new technology, which is very different from the technology of the past. But some of it has to do with the other dimension of history. You know, it's like you got a camera, and uh, sometimes you take pictures with that camera, you hold it kind of sideways, and it's pictures like that. Uh, there's a kind of vertical idea of what the picture is, and there's a vertical aspect of history which tells you uh, what is important is what came before and what came after. But then the other part of history that's very important is when you turn the camera this way, you get the wide-angle view. And what else is going on? A lot of the challenges that we face uh, trying to have good ethics about our journalism nowadays stems from the fact that other things are going on at the same time all of these technological tra changes are taking place. And they affect us as much, if not more, than many of the other things we do. We talk a lot about the principles of, of good journalism, balance, uh, objectivity, uh, fairness, uh, neutrality, all those things. And people constantly call us out on that, particularly at this time. You say you're objective. I don't think you're objective. Ah, oh, that's not truth. You got your truth, I got mine. Which one is right? You know, you aren't neutral. You didn't do this or that. Smart journalists now are redefining those terms in ways that better uh, gel with uh, what those terms have always meant. Because many people now, when they talk about ethical journalism, what we call ethical journalism, they say, oh no, that's just mainstream media. That's just the liberal press. They have liberal bias. Uh, that's not true. 
That's just their way of saying that I don't like what they say. So therefore, I'm going to define it as something bad. Are they right? Well, uh, there's been consideration of some of those things and a redefining. Uh, and for instance, we now say very clearly that objectivity is, is a method. It's a method that you use to, 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 to get at the truth. Uh, we now say that neutrality, that's, that's a voice. You try to have a neutral voice. You avoid saying I. You report in a neutral voice because that sort of underscores your objectivity. And then Bill Covage and Tom Rosenstiel, who have written this book called The Elements of Journalism, say, you know, when you talk about truth, there's truth and then there's journalistic truth. Journalistic truth is something that is sort of agreed upon over a period of time uh, between the news media, the newsmakers, and the public. There's that triangle of truth and trust. Uh, and that's what um, determines the truth. All people acting on it. Because you know, uh, as, you, as you, I'm sure you've learned uh, in classes or will learn, you can have a news story that's all facts and it's still not the truth. Because you may be missing some of the most important facts. You know, you got to get at, you, you want to get at the truth. Uh, and it's something you arrive at. One of my colleagues here, and who you've probably had in some classes, is Dan Gilmore. Dan has a way of, when people say, uh, you're not objective, why? Because you're a human being. Every human being is subjective. You're not objective. His response is, you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm subjective. I'm a human being. I have concerns that every kind of human being has. I bring them all to work with me. I don't park myself at the door and then go into the newsroom. And uh, let's, when we talk about objectivity, let's talk about it in different terms. Uh, let's talk about it in terms of thoroughness, whether the story is really thorough, it's put in context, it's accurate, uh, is it fair, and am I being transparent? Am I doing things that I'm not going to be ashamed of once you find them out? That is what really makes uh, objectivity, uh, not uh, something else. And so, uh, I don't need it. I don't want journalists. To the heroes that we root for in movies like All the President's Men. No, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, nope, not time for that yet. Uh, all right, we, 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 for one more slide, I think I have, after Dan. This ain't working. All right, give me a minute. Let me get to my notes here. The best laid plans of mice and men, not to mention Milton. Um, okay. The kind of journalism I'm talking about can perhaps be illustrated uh, with a cell phone. Because what, what, which is a digital age thing, uh, which I barely understand, uh, but, but um, the role of reporters is to be middle people. And the people, a lot of the people we cover, particularly politicians and people in government, don't want that. What they want the public to know is only what they want the public only what they want the public to know. So it's like I take this cell phone and I'm speaking here. I'm the politician. I'm the mayor. I'm the governor, and I take a selfie. And then so right after I take it, I show it to you. Don't I look good? You know, I look just like I wanted to look just like I wanted to look. That's a victory for me. The difference between that and ethical journalism is I take a selfie. Before I can turn it around, the press is in here. And they're saying, ah, oh, you know, Milton, you said this, but it wasn't true. You said that, but you left something out. Let me give it some context. Let me make it more accurate. Let me give it some thoroughness. Let me talk to some other people. 
and then we turn it around. But wait a minute, that's not, that's not the picture I took, right? But that's the true picture. And that's what we're, we're, what we're fighting to be is, is, is the people who really change that image so it comports with reality. You know, it's like, it's, it's like you know, I take a selfie uh, and, then, and then inside this little phone is Photoshop. And so uh, Photoshop changes everything around, you know. It doesn't distort it. It, puts, it. it makes the picture more truthful. And I get upset because that's not the picture that I want. So, so uh, those are a lot of the discussions that are going on now. And they're going on at a critical time because uh, Gallup reported in August that uh, Americans' faith in the mass media has hit an all-time low. It's down to 32%, the lowest it's been since Gallup started taking that. Uh, and it's even worse among Republicans, uh, which is not surprising because Republicans over the years have been doing the most to try to make that be a self-fulfilling prophecy by bashing uh, the news media. So there, there, there are all these discussions that are going on uh, among journalists, and it's going to be very interesting when this campaign is over and we all sit down and talk about, so where do we go from here? Do we let this campaign change us? Because it's very different. We've never before had people at this high level uh, who, when the fact checkers look at it, they say 70%, 70% of what this person says is not true. You can't believe it. So if I say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, uh, I can only go to three. After three, you don't believe me. I keep on talking. And I say that to you now. I say that to you tomorrow. You tell me it's not true. I say it to you again the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And when you, when you say, but that's not true. I'm like the man in The Fugitive. When Tommy Lou Jones is told by the guy, I didn't kill my wife. And he says, I don't care. I really don't care. You just lied. I don't care. I'll lie again. We're going to do it two more times? We've never had that because a part of the ethical journalism process was if you got caught doing that, you didn't want to do it again. And you wouldn't do it again. Now we do it again. People also talk about balance. And what is balance? Uh, is balance that, you know, we get one report, we get somebody who uh, says something about climate change. Oh, well, if you want to have a balanced report, you have to give equal time to the people who don't believe there's anything, such thing as climate change. 90% of the scientists in the world believe there's climate change. Uh, the balance is you say, Many people don't believe it, but then you go on. And this whole question of what has come to be called false balance in this digital age uh, is a really big thing. And to uh, give you a better insight into that and to shut up my boring mouth for a while, uh, take a look at something that recently uh, came on on a Sunday afternoon discussing uh, this question, discussion by journalists. Okay. All year long, I've been hearing one very specific description of the election coverage. No, it's not biased, but it's close. It's false equivalence, meaning journalists who are attempting to cover both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump fairly, who end up drawing false comparisons between the two. I know many Clinton supporters feel this way. Here's another way to frame this idea. When Trump is covered, is he graded on a curve, making it easier for him? Or do these cries of unfairness ring hollow? This morning, I've assembled an all-star panel of three veteran journalists to explore these questions. Jacob Weisberg, the chairman and editor-in-chief of the Slate Group and the host of the quasi-daily Trumpcast podcast. Soledad O'Brien, a former anchor on NBC and CNN, now the CEO of Starfish Media Group. And Mark Leibovich, the chief national correspondent for the New York Times Magazine and a CBS News political contributor. Jacob, let me start with you. Uh, when you uh, hear the phrase false equivalence, something I've been hearing from Clinton surrogates every single day, what does it mean to you? What does it signify? 
I was really concerned we were going to have that, that it was essentially going to be a process of treating Donald Trump as if he were a normal presidential candidate. You know, the structure of covering politics is you compare an apple and an orange, and they have different attributes, but they're both fruits, and you can take your pick. In this case, we have something more like an apple and some rancid meat, excuse the expression. I'm and sorry, is Donald <laughs> Trump the rancid He's meat? He's the rancid meat. And it, it, in all sorts of ways, I mean, it's, it's conspiracy thinking and racism. There are all sorts of things that are outside the norm of what we've accepted in American politics. And what I think the press is struggling with is how do you not not normalize him, but at the same time, be fair and do your job as a journalist. So, so you've already insulted him in the first minute of the show, calling him rancid meat. Is that being fair? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm trying. I've started my podcast because I think it's so hard in, in most media to tell it like it is. Mm. Yes, I think Trump is rancid meat. I mean, it's a metaphor. But I think he's someone who's injected a kind of toxicity into American politics that doesn't belong there, that hasn't been there before, that doesn't represent what Republicans have stood for in the past. So that are other journalists not calling it like it is, covering Trump like the unique candidate that he is? I think it's more the contortions try to try to make things seem equal all the time. So if you look at Hillary Clinton's speech where she basically pointed out that what Donald Trump has done actually quite well is normalize white supremacy of one of a long list of things that I think many Americans would find distasteful. And you would say that's true. The Clinton is, is right when she I says that. I think she made a very good argument, almost like a lawyer. Here is ways in which he has actually worked to normalize conversations that many people find hateful. And that many, and listen, I've seen on air white supremacists being interviewed because they're, they are Trump delegates and they do a five-minute segment, the first minute or so, talking about what they believe is white supremacists, right? So you have normalized that. Then Donald Trump will say, well, Hillary Clinton, she's a bigot. And it's covered, where the journalist part comes in, it's, they trade barbs. He says uh, she's a bigot, and she points out that he's a, he might be appealing to racists. He said, she said, he said, it she said. It only becomes he said, she said, when, when in, in actuality, the fact that Donald Trump has said she's a bigot, with not the long laundry list of evidence, which if you looked at Hillary Clinton's <coughs> speech, she actually did have a lot of really good factual evidence that we would all agree are things that have happened and do exist. <coughs> they're treated as if they're equal. Well, she might be a bigot. He might be have ties to racists. They're actually equal when in reality they're not equal. And I think that's where journalists are failing in the, the contortions to try to make it seem fair. Mm. But so that, that may be the default, but I've seen a lot of good examples of the press, I think, doing its job of, of call it, calling him out and telling it like it is. You know, whether it's you on this show saying there's no basis for him to claim the election's going to be stolen, or the New York Times saying in the front page lead story, Trump presents a threat to the rule of law and the Constitution. Not on the editorial page, but as a news story, because that's fact, not opinion. That's so that's absolutely. a more optimistic take. Mark, let me get your assessment on this. Are you more optimistic or pessimistic about how the press has been trying to treat Trump? Well, first of all, let me, since we are stepping back, I should step back and say that in fairness, the, a lot of Hillary Clinton supporters would say that Jacob was just being unfair to rancid meat. <laughs> oh, so oh, I believe boy. that. No, I just think that we have to have both sides here. Yeah. Um, I, I would say this. Look, I, I mean, I think there are a few terms here that we're using that I think are kind of flawed. I mean, the whole grading on a curve thing. I mean, no one agrees on the curve anymore. I mean, that's the central problem. I mean, ah. The notion of a curve in, say, math, like in fourth grade math, if this test is graded on a curve, there is an objective number that you are grading on. There is absolutely nothing objective about the agreed upon, um, you know, whatever. I mean, the more agreed upon argument in our culture that there is one arbiter, whether it's Walter Cronkite or Tim Russert or whoever, that can decide. So, I, I mean, I think the, the notion here of, of sort of um, false equivalency, whatever you want to call it, is, is not so much to strain to compare both candidates to one another, but to compare them basically to the truth, to actually use your platform as a journalist to say, look, I mean, what Donald Trump just said has no basis in fact, or Hillary Clinton has said this, in fact, she has not given a press conference in 200 and however many days. I mean, I, I do think that it, it is incumbent upon reporters to when a blatant you know, falsehood is, is spoken, to actually either parenthetically or just state it explicitly that, that this is just not true. But I, I also think that when you say, when you get into the on one hand, on the other hand thing, and mm -hmm. then make a judgment where you say, uh, this is racist, 
this is right white supremacy, you're basically trying to overturn a judgment that's been rendered by one of our two major parties, which is that this person is acceptable to be their nominee of a party. And it, right. obviously it's not a unanimous thing, but I don't know if it's journalist's job to make that rendering. So that is it difficult as someone who's been on air for, for a number of years at CNN and NBC and elsewhere to say flatly this is not true or in the case of something Trump supports this is white supremacy? Doesn't that put you at risk so as a journalist? The gentleman I'm referring to refers to himself as a white supremacist, right? This is not me saying, wow, he sounds like a white supremacist. Okay. He would tell you. He doesn't you. even say white nationalist. He I mean, that's the approved okay. euphemism. So Donald Trump racist. Mm -hmm. A lot of journalists do not say that. A lot of Clinton supporters would like journalists to say yeah, that. Yeah, and I, I actually think often people jump very quickly to racist. I, uh, to me, it is, I'm very slow to call anybody a racist. And I think in this case, it's irrelevant. The thing that we're talking about is, are you softening the ground for people who are white supremacists, who are white nationalists, who would self-identify that way to feel comfortable with their views being brought into the national discourse to the point where they can do a five-minute segment happily on, on national television? Mm. And the answer is yes, clearly. And there's lots of evidence of that. Do I have a question? Or do I have a hard time saying to somebody, that's just not true? No, I probably am over eager to do that. I actually think it's one of the most interesting and compelling things about being a journalist and being able to interview people is when you find politicians who seem notoriously a challenge with the truth often to be able to say that's literally not true. And here how, here's how it's not true. I think that's great. It's a great moment. And we should do more of it. So there you get a sense of the, of the, uh, of the tenor of that debate, and we would be absolutely wrong to blame all that on Donald Trump. Just not, not accurate. Because there are a number of other factors that contribute to it. One of them is who determines the truth. And it used to be that the so-called truth was determined by a small group of folks, uh, a bunch of white guys, who worked at prestigious newspapers, uh, who had an awful lot of influence. Now, however, with with the birth of the internet and the growth of the internet, anybody can be a publisher, anybody can be a critic, and uh, so it's not so easy to determine that. Uh, it's kind of like you have this thing that I would call reality journalism, you know, where anybody can do it. And uh, it's harder to ascertain what is really the truth, especially when some of those people who are arguing what the truth is and what the truth is not clearly have motives. That they will say in a minute, this is my motive, this is what I'm doing. Are you, uh, uh, are you an impartial newspaper? No. I'm a conservative website. Uh, I, I deal with conservative uh, matters. Uh, the other thing that really complicates it, going back to, to me and my selfie, is Twitter. Twitter is just a wonderful way to do selfies because, you know, it used to be if you were a politician and you said one thing to this side of the room and another thing to that side of the room, you were in trouble because the journalist would call you out on that. And uh, you'd say, oh, I'm not going to do that again because that looks bad. Uh, or if you said something at a press conference uh, you, um, uh, and it wasn't true, and the journalist called you out on that, you were in trouble. Good thing about Twitter is, hey, you can say it in 140 characters anytime you want to your own audience, the people who decide that they want to follow your, what you say on Twitter, they want to listen to you. And you don't have to worry about those pesky reporters. You can even do it at 3 in the morning if you want to. And, and, and therefore, you get the advantage because you tell them what the news is. And unless the reporters are tuned into you also, they don't get it, uh, except they have to react to it. So Twitter is really good for that. The internet is really good for creating a lot more uh, people who can judge whether or not uh, something is true. And then you have, then you have all news TV, uh, which is really great for you as a, as a politician or as a government person. Why? It used to be, if you were a politician or a government person, you would die for airtime. You, you know, God, I gotta, I gotta get something uh, into the Arizona Republic. I gotta get something on Channel 12. What do I do to get it on there? Well, 
Now you got all news TV, uh, all news all the time. Uh, it's really talk TV. The news doesn't happen as often as they'd like for it to happen. So consequently, you can turn on CNN tonight and they'll, they will uh, give you a blurb that says breaking news. That breaking news broke 48 hours ago. They're still telling you the same thing. And they put all their resources into the political campaign, so they got to have people to talk about it. So if you're the politician, if you're Hillary Clinton, you can say, hey, this is really great. Because they do the same newscast over and over. It's an hour-long newscast. They just change the faces and everything. If I can get some surrogates to get up there and say the same thing that I would say uh, at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, I got six shots saying the same thing free. Don't cost me nothing. And I can keep pounding away at that. It didn't used to be that way. One of the great profiles of courage occurred on CNN way, way back during the Republican primary when the governor of Florida was asked a question two or three times and gave the same evasive answer. He didn't answer the question. And finally, Mika Brzezinski told the people, cut him. They cut him. He went off the air. And I said, hey, that's right. That's good. You don't have to go for that okie doke. But that's really an advantage uh, that you get. You also get the advantage that since the newspapers have uh, gone down, the newspapers had the experienced reporters. We used to talk about, we still talk about, Walter Cronkite as the face of the CBS Evening News. Uh, the most trusted face in journalism. You know, uh, that was true. W Walter Cronkite really was what we call WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. The problem is people didn't understand what all they were getting with Walter Cronkite. I mean, yeah, he was up there, he was reading the news, but he was also the managing editor of CBS Evening News. He was deciding what news they were going to broadcast. He had been a war correspondent who'd gone on bombing runs and shot, shot down fighter planes from the other side. He had worked in Washington. He had been a journalist. He brought a lot of experience and know-how. Most of the people you see on television now, they don't bring all that. They, and you, how can you tell? They ask bad questions. They, they seem more interested in trying to get the person to say something else than to further the story. All that happens because of these things we have in the digital age. All those things say we have to come up with different ways to define digital journalism, with different ways to talk about ethical journalism, rather, uh, in the digital age. I'd like to move the last part of this to talking about digital journalism, uh, ethical journalism in the digital age, in a slightly different way, by bringing on someone who talks about journalism uh, in a way that sometimes is a little crude, but also sometimes makes us laugh. But my challenge is to bring it back to being serious. So let's start with the first one. And warning, some of this language is going to be a little rough. Journalists, the heroes that we root for in movies like All the President's Men, The Great Muppet Caper, and most recently, Spotlight. <laughs> We gotta nail these scumbags. We gotta show people that nobody can get away with this. Not a priest or a cardinal or a freaking pope. Now remember, Spotlight actually won Best Picture at the Oscars this year, meaning newspapers finally received the recognition that we normally reserve for subjects of such importance as the incredible bravery of real-life Hollywood filmmakers, the incredible bravery of fictional Hollywood filmmakers, <laughs> and the incredible bravery of wanting to f your daughter's friend. <laughs> One of, one of the things that made Spotlight so powerful is the knowledge that the newspaper industry today is in big trouble. Papers have been closing and downsizing for years, and that affects all of us. Even if you only get your news from Facebook, Google, Twitter, or Ariana Huffington's block quote junction and book excerpt clearinghouse, <laughs> those places are often just repackaging the work of newspapers, and it is not just websites. Watch how often TV news ends up citing print sources. According to the Chicago Tribune. According to the Detroit Free Press. According to the San Francisco Chronicle. According to the Times Picayune. The Boston Globe. The Orlando Sentinel. The Philadelphia Inquirer. The Pittsburgh Tribune Review. The Detroit News. And the Houston Chronicle reports. The Los Angeles Times reports. The Oklahoman reports. The Hartford Current reports. The Salt Lake Tribune reports. 
It's pretty obvious. Without newspapers around to cite, TV news would just be Wolf Blitzer endlessly batting a ball of yarn around. <laughs> and, and it is... John Oliver. <laughs> Good press critic. But a lot of the things that he says um, really are true. And, and we can, uh, on the one hand, sort of laugh at ourselves, but on the other hand, we need to pay close attention. He talks about the demise of newspaper journalism, which, uh, which I've already talked about to a certain degree. And he also, in the next segment, does the John Oliver way of talking about what that has really meant to other folks in the media and how that gets translated into what we actually report and ask us to ask ourselves, what does that say about ethical journalism? Go to the next one, please. Not a year goes by without us not having to have our horrified reactions captured in ash forever. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Oregonian circulation has since dropped, and in 2013, just as Harry Estev was working on his lottery series, their parent company, Advanced Publications, dropped a bombshell. This picture, tweeted out from inside the Oregonian, shows staffers listening as editor Peter Badia broke the news some had feared. The paper will split in two, stop seven-day-a-week home delivery, and lay off some employees. This is an, a strategic move to really focus everybody on what that digital uh, future is and what our digital products and services can be. It's true, they became a digital first company. And digital first sounds like a high school euphemism for seductively sucking on a finger. Uh, I put my finger in his mouth, we totally got to digital first. <laughs> it, it was like, ew, but it was also like, hot. <laughs> meant big changes. A local weekly, the Willamette Week, got their hands on a PowerPoint presentation for the Oregonian staff, outlining the fact reporters would be expected to meet a quota of three blog posts a day, and on any post of substance, they would have to post the first comment. And what better way to win the trust of your readers than posting first underneath your own article? Those rules were widely criticised and have since been relaxed, but extra digital demands being placed on journalists is now common throughout the industry. Just listen to Washington Post editor Marty Barron, who you might remember as the guy Liev Schreiber played in Spotlight. Uh, he describes his concerns about the average workload required of journalists. They have to do their traditional reporting, they have to participate in social media, they have to produce a wire service that's available 24 hours a day, they have to be responsible for video, uh, you name it, uh, they're, involved, they're involved in it. Uh, it's a lot to ask. That's true. And if journalists are constantly required to write, edit, shoot videos and tweet, mistakes are going to get made. Perhaps that is how the Boston Globe wound up tweeting following a shooting in Tennessee that the FBI had investifarted about 70 leads. <laughs> Clearly, if they had more time, they would have written hashtag investifarted because that's how you drive the conversation. Hashtag investifarted. Now... Uh, OK, but he's, he's onto something there because he talks about the time element and the time we have before we report something, before deadline. And one thing that the digital age has done is there is no longer the story of the day, there's the story of the hour or the story of the minute. And also, because we now can do such good work online, uh, a lot fewer people do real reporting, old gumshoeing, as we used to say, where you go out. Uh, instead, you get things uh, off the internet, you just paste them in the story, and uh, if, you, if you're if you're good at that, you come out okay. Otherwise, you lose your job because you're plagiarized, uh, which is why it's, it is so important uh, that we have here at the Cronkite School a policy uh, on plagiarism and fabrication. And that has become much, e much easier uh, in this particular uh, time. Um, the other thing is that the digital age has produced a new generation of owners who are very much not like Eugene Meyer and Adolf Oaks. They are very different in what they are looking for and what they're going to pay for. Sam Zell was a guy who bought the Tribune Company that published the Chicago Tribune, the Orlando Sentinel, uh, the Los Angeles Times, Newsday, Baltimore Sun. 
And uh, he made a point in talking to people when he bought the newspaper that um, reporters were expensive. Yes, they were. Good reporters are very expensive. Uh, and he made the point that I don't want to do expensive journalism. I want to do journalism that gets me enough money so maybe I can pay one or two of the 40 reporters we now have, the one or two that are left. So Zell decided that, no, I'm not going to have uh, those kind of journalists. He was emblematic of other publishers. And it's interesting to look at what then happened to the Chicago Tribune uh, after he sold it, got out of Dodge by sundown, and how that interfaces with the digital world that all of you are going to confront when you leave Cronkite and go into the business. Run this one. Heads. All the poppy news that's fit to print, and maybe some Iraq news too, if we can afford it, f you. <laughs> Now, the good news is Zell no longer owns the Tribune Company. The bad news is their latest attempt to balance business pressures with journalistic responsibility has not been confidence-inspiring. Just this year, its publishing arm, Tribute Publishing, was rebranded into something much, much stupider. This is the future of journalism. This is the future of content. It doesn't get much better than that. If you care about media and technology, this is the place to be. Trunk stands for Tribune Online Content. Yes, Trunk. They have chosen to call themselves Trunk, which sounds like the noise an ejaculating elephant makes. <laughs> or, or more appropriately, the sound of a stack of print newspapers being thrown into a dumpster. And, and if you are wondering how Trunk's business model will be different, get ready to have your minds trunked. One of the key ways we're going to harness the power of our journalism is to have a optimization group. This Trunk team will work with all of the local markets to harness the power of our local journalism, feed it into a funnel, and then optimize it so that we reach the biggest global audience possible. What the f did she just say? They're going to feed journalism into a funnel. We're just going to take content and simply cram it down your throat like you're an abused goose. <laughs> and the corresponding visuals make even less sense. What is happening here? It looks like a bunch of digital sperm impregnating a trunk egg. But, but what seems at first like a banal corporate rebranding speech quickly goes off the rails with their next big idea. Artificial intelligence is going to allow journalists to do their jobs more efficiently. Finding the right photos, the videos, the databases, the things that you repackage your stories with. Right now, that's a manual effort. With artificial intelligence, you can create a system that automatically is doing that for you. OK, OK, OK. Putting aside the news robots, I would like to take a moment to break down what may be the most meaningless graphic ever created. <laughs> Okay, uh, I got like four or five minutes left and I'm gonna do two and that'll allow you to do some questions. There's a lot more to this. The other thing I would have talked about more if I had more time is the other side of the digital uh, age ownership of newspapers, which is money. Because uh, what money has done is created a number of newspaper owners, a number of news site owners rather, who are willing to go against truth by shutting down the news, the news sites. That's what happened to Gawker uh, in the Hulk Hogan case, where uh, Peter Thiel, the guy who founded PayPal, was ticked off at Gawker because they outed him as being gay. And so he invested in the Hulk Hogan case. He paid $10 million in legal fees for Hulk, for Hulk Hogan uh, that drove Gawker out of business. Um, Donald Trump has done the same thing to try to drive people out of business. One of the things that you won't hear about in the trial of Trump University is that he tried to get uh, to, sh to silence one of the critics, but the court said, no, you cannot uh, do that. Also, Sheldon Adelson, who uh, is a big contributor uh, to campaigns, uh, Sheldon Adelson didn't like the fact that a reporter for the Las Vegas Review Journal uh, wrote a critical article uh, wrote a book that was critical of him in one passage. Uh, he sued, and uh, 
Uh, he didn't win the lawsuit, but by the time it was thrown out, the reporter was, the reporter was filing for bankruptcy. What Adelson then did after that was he bought the newspaper. The editors told the columnist he could no longer report on Sheldon Adelson. Adelson quit. I mean, the reporter quit. The newspaper no longer works there. Trump sued the guy who wrote the book for $5 billion, with a B, dollars. Lost the suit. Had to pay a million dollars in legal fees and said, I won. Why? Because the, the guy had to pay more money. And, and Trump wanted to make sure he thought that people wouldn't read the book. That's what we are sort of facing uh, in the future. That is what you have to fight, because those are the protections uh, that allow you to do ethical journalism. I can talk more about that later if you want to. But in the meantime, if you got questions, I'd be glad to answer them. And do I, they come up to the mic, right, and ask your question. If you got a question, you can ask and I'll answer it. Otherwise, you can come up to me afterwards. Otherwise, you can go home. You know, whatever, you, whatever's there. Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, isn't the real problem that Trump, Trump is speaking to his audience, Clinton is speaking to her audience, MSNBC is, is speaking to its audience, Fox News is speaking to its audience, so it doesn't care whether it's balanced. In fact, the only way it's going to keep going is to report news that's going to keep the interest of those extremists. I, I agree with you. Uh, I go at least 50 percent down the way with you, because you're right that Trump is speaking to Trump's people and Hillary is speaking to her people. And uh, I think that nobody is really speaking to the, the middle. Yeah. Fox isn't trying to do it, and MSNBC will say they're trying to do it. But, you know, I don't think most people believe that. The problem is we have nobody in the middle. Right. Maybe we have CNN, but CNN's not doing good journalism. But the point that you have made that I think is important is for people to understand what an election is really about. It's not, a, for Trump, it's not about speaking to the middle. Mm -hmm. It's not about the pivot. For Hillary, it's not about the pivot. Their bases have been locked in. They're not changing. And so what they want to do is continue to fire up their bases. Why? Because the election is decided by the one who gets the most votes. Yeah. It's that simple. It's just like when my son was running uh, track. The, the coaches always said, the race is not won by the fastest man on the track, but by the one who crosses the finish line first. Mm -hmm. So the same, thing, the same thing is happening in the U.S. Congress, where you don't have anybody in the middle anymore, mm -hmm. and you don't have people talking together. You have Republicans talking to Republicans, Democrats talking to Democrats, and you don't have that interchange that you used to have when you had you know, uh, moderate Republicans and Democrats. I agree with you 100 percent. That is the problem. That's the problem we face. And, and people who are elected to Congress now do not feel it is their job to make laws. It's to continue fighting uh, partisan fights. I agree with you. 75% of it. That's good. Uh, any other questions going once? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Grace. Hi, Grace. Hello. I was wondering if you have any opinions or comments about WikiLeaks, especially how fast the media seems to accept them as real documents, and whether they are or not, it seems that it's clear whoever is leaking them might have alternate motivations than just transparency. Uh, there was a whole section I was going to get to on WikiLeaks. I'll tell you more about it afterwards. But, the, but WikiLeaks poses an ethical problem for us because it's the big data dump. And uh, the, the question is not new. The question for journalists has always been, um, just because I can, do I report all this? WikiLeaks gives you a whole lot of stuff. You have to decide uh, what to report. And you face the same problem with WikiLeaks data as you did with anything else. How can you verify it? The, the people who don't practice good ethical journalism will just throw anything out there because you can. The people who are responsible uh, will not report everything there because they'll take the principles into consideration. It's just like when you're covering uh, a trial for sexual assault. Everybody in the courtroom knows the name of the woman. It's right there on the documents. She's right there in the courtroom. 
but, but because of your ethics, you say, we're not going to report her name. Why? Because society says that's not a decent thing to do, and we're not going to do it. So I think WikiLeaks really challenges that. And to be honest with you, or to be more thorough with you, I don't know if I'm always being honest, um, that um, uh, there's this thing called shield laws, which, which allow journalists to protect their sources. Nearly every state in the union, plus the District of Columbia, has a shield law. We were trying to get a shield law passed on the federal level. Uh, and we were just about there when along comes WikiLeaks. And the question becomes, if we're going to protect journalists who leak information, who's a journalist? You know, is Julian Assange a journalist? Is Edward Snowden a journalist? Or are they people who ought to be tried because they're whistleblowers, because they did espionage on the government? Are they, in effect, traitors? That's the real issue that is posed by that, in addition to two other things which are connected with that, uh, that affect ethical journalism. Confidentiality, both of them are related to confidentiality. If the Russians or anybody uh, sitting on a bed weighing 400 pounds, as Trump said, can hack you, can hack the government, they certainly can hack the computers of the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Arizona Republic, two of which they've already done. Second one is, if I'm a journalist trying to protect my sources, what if they hack into my cell phone? And as, so as a result, you now have some newsrooms that are using encrypted software uh, to talk to one another, and reporters who are buying and using throwaway cell phones, because that's the only way you can protect our sources. Those are other impacts of this uh, particular digital age. Does that answer your question? OK. Go on once. Go on twice. I hope, all, I hope this has been useful to all of you. I'd be glad to talk with anybody afterwards. In the meantime, you're going into a tough new world out there. Uh, good luck. Good luck.